So I guess I'm going to start talking about it. So yes, as uh, Monchin Sensei uh, mentioned, today I'll be talking about Shugendo, uh, which is basically Japanese mountain asceticism. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back and be able to do these presentations. As always, uh, thank you for allowing me to do these presentations. Um, I think Monchin Sensei knows, I don't think a lot of other people know, but uh, as I was figuring out uh, kind of like Buddhism and trying different things myself, I was uh, part of a Shugendo Association for about one year just before I came and joined TBI. So it's a topic that I have uh, yet encountered, I guess, myself, and it's part of the reason why I decided to talk about it today. So... What today is going to look like is uh, it's going to be different than my usual presentation. As you, all of you know, normally I focus on a particular topic and talk about different authors and what they say about it. This time is going to feel a bit different. Um, and uh, I hope everybody's going to be able to appreciate it. So today we're going to talk a bit about what is uh, Shigendo specifically. I mean more like looking at the name itself, the kanji, etc. What does it mean or what different ways you can interpret what Shigendo is. Uh, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time today talking about the history, but also giving a sample practices, a bunch of different uh, practices that have historically been there in Shugendo. Not all of them are uh, always relevant uh, today, not in terms of they're not relevant, but like um, they're not really popular as like the main key practices. So instead of calling them key practices, I call them sample practices, but they're still pretty much there. Uh, then I'm going to spend a bit of time to kind of Put it all together okay we have all these practices what does it mean like what is the core of what a shigendo is trying to do and finishing up with a bit of a of a conclusion concluding thoughts um as per usual so first of all shigendo is a can be understood as uh the first kanji shu is like discipline uh conduct it can also be mastery uh sometimes it's study uh second kanji gen uh, could be could mean effect or efficacy, also verification or testing, but also omen. And then do, I think we're all familiar with do. It's uh, the path, the way, teachings. So you could understand shigendo to mean different things, like the way of discipline and testing, the way of mastery of testing, or the way of ascetic mastery. Uh, the people that are practicing shigendo can be called three things. They can be called either shigenja, genja, or yamabushi. So Shigenja, same kanji, but the last one means person instead of uh, the way. So a person of discipline and testing or a person who masters testing or an ascetic person, for example. Um, Genja specifically is oftentimes used to mean ascetic. So an ascetic practitioner, you would say Genja. Shugenja is an ascetic practitioner specifically of the Shugendo tradition. Uh, so Genja is more like an overarching theme. Uh, it's still oftentimes very much used within the context of talking about Shigendo. Uh, but so that's why you can mean, you can say that Shigenda can, Shigenja can also means like an ascetic person uh, because of the meaning of Genja specifically. Uh, oftentimes, Shigendo practitioners are known as Yamabushi, so Yama mountain, and Bushi is like prostration to bow. Uh, so you can understand it either as a person who bows in the mountain, meaning like, you know, when you do your practices, you bow and everything. So you do the practices in the mountain or someone that bows to the mountain as a kind of honorific uh, thing that we will see how the mountains play such a key role in Shigendo. So Shigendo is known to be like one of its trademark, if you would say, is the fact that it's a, a blend of different religion. Um, the first one that is kind of key that I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about is Shinto, uh, folk religion, aka Shinto, uh, the way of the deities, the way of the gods. So I'm not going to dive too much into it because it's an entire topic on its own. Uh, the historical Shinto is not necessarily accurate of the Shinto that we know today. We know that there's been an, uh, uh, when Imperial Japan came into, into being, then Shinto became its own thing and it's closer to the Shinto that we know today. Historically speaking, you can't really speak to a certain extent of like a, a Shinto tradition uh, as like a religious, uh, like religion in the way that we understand it. So I'm still going to treat it in this case as like a, a, a religion, but you just have to keep in mind that when we talk about ancient Shinto, it would it's not 100% accurate to talk about it in terms of it's, oh, it's an organized religion. It's more like a set of beliefs that uh, were presented today. So 
So basically, Shinto is a is a religion that centers around belief in and rituals that are focused on the kami, oftentimes of places such as mountain, uh, ocean, rivers, etc. Uh, so these places are thought to be part of what we it's called like the other world. And the religion came to be through a process of welcoming, enshrining, and celebrating the kami of sacred places and accepting them as guardian deities of either a family, a clan, or village, etc. Uh, to, to do so, people entered these otherworldly areas to draw the power of the kami and that power could then be used to perform magical religious activities for the benefit of the family, the village, uh, the clan, etc. So over time, with the introduction of knowledges from India, China, Korea, etc., practitioners were equipped with a vast array of tools to receive benefits from and or manipulate divine forces. And around the 9th and 10th century, uh, the Shugenja, who have been cultivating these techniques and follow ascetic practices in the mountain, became a more important figure. Shugendo, at this, basically, it captured localized animism combined with Shintoism. It sucked in shamanism and Taoism, and it ended up fusing with esoteric Buddhism to build like a system of rituals that invoke great power that can be used for the benefit of others. It's precisely at the time of the 9th and 10th century that Shigenja truly consolidated themselves as an organized religion that we can more historically accurately call Shigendo. So that is more about um, talking. I'm, I'm diving a little bit into the changing societal roles of the Yamabushi and all that kind of stuff. So uh, in ancient times, there were guides, divine manipulators, protectors, etc., and during medieval times, the lives of people in society were organized around three kind of main religious authorities, if I can call them that. Uh, so regional security was organized around the clan or local deity and was under the responsibility of Shinto. Then funeral and ancestral rites were organized around family or clan temples and were under the responsibility of Buddhism. And stuff that had to do with healing or avoiding misfortunes. Uh, was organized around esoteric practices and fell, therefore, in the responsibility of Buddhism and Shigendo. When the Tokugawa period came, so that's like 1603 and 1868, the government imposed restrictions on religion that basically forced Shigendo practitioners to settle permanently in villages uh, and establish something that would be, you know, similar to what we know as like parishes uh, that were oftentimes connected to greater Shugendo complex that could be in completely different other provinces. So living in the mid in the village made mountain ascetic uh, have strong and lasting impact on folk practices of the common people. For example, uh, common rites of passage that are nowadays related to folk religion were primarily organized and performed by Yamagushi, Yamabushi that were settled in villages during the Tokugawa period. However, when the Meiji... So this is the medieval times. There were healers, protectors, but also ones that performed rites, like rites of passages, etc. So in modern time, when the Meiji Restoration started in 1868, Japan sought to foster a national identity anchored in its own traditional past and created Shinto as we know it uh, in order to facilitate that process. It was thus important for the, the fostering of this new Japanese identity to separate between what is Japanese, Shinto, and what is not, so Buddhism and the rest. This policy is known as Shinbutsu Bunri, and because of this, Shigendo was banned and outlawed by the Meiji government in 1872 and was labeled as barbaric and backwards because the purity of Shinto was perceived to be sullied by the intermingling with Buddhism, shamanism, etc., that is at the core of Shigendo practice. With this ban, Shigenja were forced to become lay practitioners, uh, so in the form of either Shinto shrine attendants or Buddhist priests. Some sections of Shigendo survived by becoming affiliated with Tendai or Shingon temples, but were now forced to operate under severe restrictions forsaking a lot of their historical practices that were not primarily Buddhist. In the present day, Shugendo has lost most of its historical practices and is barely any different from the esoteric practices practiced by Tendai and Shingon. 
And in fact, it is often viewed, Shigendo is often viewed as simply another kind of practice that is offered by Tindai or Shingon curriculum rather than its own individual tradition as it's historically has been. So I alluded a little bit as to why mountains are important in Shigendo. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this still within the context of the history of Shigendo. So as some of us know in ancient times, uh, but even to this day, but in ancient times, people relied on mountains for their survival and they really formed the backbone of a society, especially in Japanese context, because let's not forget that like 75% of Japanese, Japan's geography are mountains. So it's really important. A lot of the stuff revolved around them. For example, in folk religion, uh, the grandson of the sun goddess, Amaterasu, uh, Ninigo no Mikoto, descended from the heavens to the peak of Mount Takachiho. And stories like this are things that made mountains to be un understood to be liminal places. And what I mean by liminal places is like where the boundaries between heaven and earth are blurred. It's a place of power that you can encounter the divine. So with Buddhism's influence starting to grow in the sixth century onwards, mountains would gradually develop into sites of also Buddhist training. Similar to folk religion, practitioners of Buddhism would enter the mountains to encounter the divine or the Dharma. And particular mountain ranges rapidly became very important for Shigendo practitioners. One of the first was the, the, the three mountains of Kumano, the Kumano Sanzan. Uh, and there, there were three deities that were enshrined, uh, Kanon Busatsu, Yakushinyorai, and Amida Nyorai. So from this point on, Kumano, the Kumano Sanzan became a, a place of pilgrimage for nobles and commoners alike, as it became a place where one could alleviate their suffering with Kanon Bosatsu, heal their ailments with Yakushinyorai, but also seek a peaceful death with Amida Nyorai. And Shugendo practitioners who were experts in mountain ascetic practices were oftentimes used as guides and healers for the pilgrims. So they thus started, the Shigendo practitioners uh, gathered around this particular mountain range starting in the 8th century. So the Kumano Sanzan is a very important mountain range for Shigendo, and eventually many different ones became very important. So now that we talked a little bit about the, uh, the history, I'm going to go through uh, just a bunch of PowerPoints that's going to be a little bit quick about just the different kinds of practices that have been there in uh, Shingendo historically. So one, actually it's kind of one, but it's also three in one and more than that, but it's the Nyubu Shugyo. So they're basically mountain practices. Um, generally speaking, you can kind of like distinguish between three types of practices. Uh, one of them is to enter the mountain in order to make offerings in honor of the various de deities. So you could enter a mountain to read sutras or even bury uh, sutras. A second type of practice would be entering mountain for a certain period of time in order to cultivate ascetic practice. And you would do that in order to receive particular kind of initiation, a particular kind of teaching. And the last one is a more difficult kind of ascetic retreat that has historically taken place in wintertime, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and that's a, a training that's made specifically with the purpose of acquiring spiritual powers in the mountain. Following these practices, you have another practice called, called Shokanjo, which is a consecration ceremony made at the end, typically of a mountain practice. Uh, and that ritual basically symbolizes one's final attainment of Buddhahood in this body after having passed through the 10 realms of health to Buddhahood through mountain practice. Towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk specifically about this idea of like the 10 realms from health to Buddhahood. So I'm not going to dive too much into it right now, but it's basically like, imagine like a, a certificate that you've succeeded basically in the form of a ritual. It's, it's more than this, but I'm really making it as simple as possible. So other practices are Genrakube or Genjutsu. Uh, Genkurabe, sorry, or Genjutsu. Uh, this is basically to uh, like proof of the testimony of what you've achieved in the mountains. So they usually take the form of spectacular demonstration to demonstrate the power that you've attained through your, cult your, your practices in the mountain. Oftentimes they take the form of like firewalking, as we can see in the picture, competitive rituals also. Uh, sitting in boiling water, climbing sword ladders. So things that would show that you've attained some kind of like uh, spiritual power through the, the practice that you've done. 
Other historical practices, uh, Kyoho, which are very similar to what we do, for example, at Tendai. Uh, so they're just rites of worship that can take the form of uh, offerings of respect. So when you clean, uh, decorate an altar, these kind of things. Uh, also worship in terms of chanting, chanting sutras, for example, bowing, but also in terms of uh, beneficial actions, such as offerings of incense, uh, water, food, etc., money too. Some other practices that we're not used to talk about, for example, in in in, in, in generally speaking, is uh, boksen, so fortune telling, uh, oracle reading, uh, similar as we would do in generally speaking, people that consult oracles or fortune telling is to be able to discover the fate of humans, like what's going to happen in our lives or is sometimes the life of others. There's other practices that have connected to the, the shamanistic past, for example, Fujitsu. Uh, and Yorigito, which are connected to mediums and oracles. So the Fujitsu one is basically the, the Shugenda obtains oracle by it the Shugenja practitioner himself being a medium. So he would call on the spirit of a Buddha or a Kami to basically possess them, and then the spirit would talk through their body. So the Shugenja is the medium to which the message is being transmitted. Yorigito is a bit different, but it's similar. It's basically the Shugenda is not the medium. It's another person becomes possessed, and then the Shugenja ask question to this possessed person to basically get uh, various answers to queries and requests, etc. Other practices, Goma. Goma is a thing that is, you know, in esoteric Buddhism, Tendai Shingon, uh, we see it often. So a liturgy is performed before a fire that is burning. And offerings are given uh, into the fire uh, for, to the objects of worships, and then you do prayers and all these kinds of things. So it's something that's uh, very present in uh, in Buddhist rituals in general. But there is uh, particular goma ceremonies that are unique to Shugendo. For example, the Saito goma, which is unique to Shugendo, which if you think about it, it's very similar to a regular goma. Just think about it as bigger and outdoors. And it's oftentimes performed before practice, sometimes during and regularly after mountain practice. Other practices, exorcisms. So Tsukimono Otoshi, which is and Chobuku, both of them are um, exorcism. Just think about it in terms of there's a, there's a belief that, you know, the diseases are something that happens uh, that is like it's caused like a bad thing that happens is caused by malefic spirits or spirits that are angry, etc. So if your disease is caused by an angry spirit, then to heal the disease, you have to exorcise the spirit. This is basically these rituals. Uh, Chobuku, the only difference is this one is a little bit more intense because uh, you would call on into the powers of deities in order to subdue uh, evil spirits and others, but they're both exorcist rituals. And lastly, more simple practice, uh, Fuju, Majinai, uh, it's just charms, uh, you know, simple requests of like, I want to do well on an exam, I want to have a self -chi childbirth, I want to be protected, uh, I want healing for myself or others. And then you would carve uh, like particular symbols, uh, amulets of power that a person can just carry with them and it would provide them with the, the, the request that was made for whichever reason the person wanted to. So these are some of the, 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 the practices that historically has been part of Shugendo. Um, like I said earlier, most of them are still can be practiced today, uh, but I don't think some of them are still very much mainstream, especially with the changes that Shugendo had uh, over time. But now what I want to talk about it is more like, like what is the like the logic of it all? And I'm I'm hoping that by going through the different practices and talking about them individually, we were able to kind of like notice a pattern. So the 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 logic of how Shigendo operates is that by going into the liminal space of the mountains to perform ascetic practices, the Shugenja achieves identification with a deity, which is you know the key core of what esoteric practices and Buddhisms are. So you would go to a liminal space, like a divine area that you can connect with a deity and identify with it in order to gain something. Then after having done that in the mountain, you have the consecration ritual where the Shigenja gains the ability to control the power that is that attained via identification with the deity that happened in the space. And in this case, the liminal space of the mountain specifically. 
Following this, the Shugenja perform supernatural freak to prove to the public that they have obtained such powers. Then the Shugenja returns to society and uses the power and knowledge they obtain to help with all sorts of requests. And finally, everybody says thank you to the nice Shugenja and everyone is happy. So this is the, the, the rationale of how Shugendo operates. And earlier, the key practice that is at, kind of like at the core of what we're talking about here is, you know, the first one is going to the liminal space of the mountain specifically to perform ascetic practices. This is the thing that I guess Shugendo is kind of like known for. Um, it's his main way of doing this. So a lot of the other rituals that we saw, like Goma and other things are stuff that you can do at home. You can do with, you can do sometimes in the space of a temple, but for Shugendo, you go into the mountains to be able to gain that kind of knowledge that you can bring back to society to help others. So that training is um, can be called, oftentimes it's called Jukai Shugyo, so the training, the 10 realms training. So what are the 10 realms that we're talking about? Well, the six realms of samsara, so hell, hungry ghosts, animals, asura, humans, and gods, devas. And what are the remaining four? Well, it's the four realms of awakening, which is the realm of the Shravaka Buddhas, of the Pratyeka Buddhas, of the Bodhisattvas, and of the Buddhas. So this is the ten, the 10 realms. So what do we mean by the training of the 10 realms? What does that look like? So it's basically a series of initiations, which take away the comforts of daily life in order for the practitioner to experience the 10 realms and reveal Buddha nature. So the goal if you want to put it that way, if Shigendo training is, well, we're going to make sure that you experience all of those 10 realms so that if you go through all of the realms, you have like a connection to that. You can talk about it. You can know what, what it's like to be there, et cetera. And then at the end, you kind of progress to the 10th realm, which is the last one, which is Buddhahood. And when you've reached that, you're kind of like, okay, well, I've gone to the training. I've went from hell to Buddhahood in the mountain. And therefore, you've attained, you know, particular powers and all that stuff there. And then you consecrate that knowledge to kind of make sure that it like gets cemented in you. So that's kind of the idea that is meant by the town realm. So what would that look like, for example? So the intense physical activity, the lack of sleep, the darkness, the weather, the mud make you experience all the afflictions, the kleshas and the fears of hell. Also. Keep in mind that the, uh, uh, you know, we saw earlier that there's some of the practices that is about walking into a fire that also happens oftentimes before the training and it symbolizes that you're in hell in that particular moment. So going through hell. Then fasting while doing intense physical activity makes you experience the hunger and desperation of hungry ghosts. The surrounding of the wild mountain forces you to act on instinct like an animal. The constant difficulties encountered throughout the journey forces you to fight physically, emotionally, spiritually, like an Ashura. And the, exp the experience you, you face in the mountain will make you face many of the markers of existence in the human realm. But also, the success of each initiation state, overcoming of an obstacle, the reaching of the peak of the mountain, etc., will make you gloat with pride and arrogance like a god. So you can see the idea of the, the six realms of samsara here being at play. And then about the last four. So noticing, noticing the functioning of the natural world of the mountain and your body within it will give you the externally focused wisdom of the Shravaka Buddhas. Experiencing the constant coming and going of each of the six realms throughout the various journey will give you the internally focused insights of the Pratyeka Buddhas. Performing the training in a group, supporting each other in the process while performing ritual to deities, and remembering why the hell you chose to do this in the first place will make you experience the happiness of benefiting others of the Bodhisattvas. And lastly, the totality of all of these allow you to reach the state of boundless wisdom, courage, compassion, vitality, etc. of the Buddhas, where reality is experienced following the purification of the three poisons via training. So this is the idea behind the Shugendo training. This is what it looks like and is supposed to feel like.
uh, as you go through it. And it's organized in a way that it's supposed to make you go through these 10 stages. So the way that it can be, the way that uh, a particular Shugendo, a teacher and practitioner, which is the one that I was affiliated with, uh, talks about it in the book that he has. He talks about it as the liminal spaces of a mountain acts like a womb. So through the performance of ceremonies of ritual death and rebirth, a reaction takes place in the mountain. The mountain is a place where like you constantly die of one realm and rebirth in another. And then you go back to it. And one time you're okay and you feel like a God. And a second later you're starving. And it's this constant rituals of like um, death and rebirth within the mountain. So being slowly stripped off of your casual comforts, the habitual experiences of the self die in practitioners. And the death of the self through all of this stuff that's happening in the mountain provokes an entrance into the realm of the deities. This entrance into the realm of the deities allow the practitioner to go beyond normal physical, psychological, and spiritual experiences, and that initiates the gestation of a new being in the womb of the mountain. And then the practitioner comes out of the training reborn, having gone through the multiple experiences of death and rebirths in the tell realm that is facilitated by the liminal nature of the mountains. So this is like the core of what Shugendo practices are about. Now, what can Shugendo teach us? You know, I always try to, uh, I almost did a joke. I, I wanted to be like, um, you know, why is Shugendo important to us? And then I was about to write, it's not, but I, di I didn't do it. I hope some people will laugh about this, but what, can, what can you teach us? Because I think there's always teaching that can be learned from all these kinds of interaction. So um, first of all, I would say is remember Ikayana. So, you know, the one path. So although the practices of Shugendo might look different to people, it's still part of the one path to awakening. Buddhism is an incredibly rich tradition with so many different unique approaches to go about practicing. So that is one of the message that Shugendo can tell us is this is one way. And if it resonates with you, then that is a good way that you can go about attaining, you know, enlightenment, Buddhahood, et cetera, in this lifetime in the same way that is claimed by Tendai and Shingon to be able to do to their practices. It's just a different format. And maybe that's one that can fit well to you. But if anything, you can just, we can just appreciate the variety of unique approaches that people have come up with to be able to practice Buddhism. Secondly, Buddhist practices should not be limited to when we are sitting down on the cushion in the comfort of a home or a temple. Like, go outside. Nature is an incredible teacher of the Dharma. And if you pay attention to its many guides and let yourself be moved to insight to them, you can realize a lot of really important things. Also, do not be afraid of the six realms of samsara. So the klesha, the trivisa, which is the, 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 the three poisons, do not be afraid of them. So just like Shigendo is kind of trying to do in their training, rather than avoiding these in your life, be with them, experience them, get to know them, which is what Shigendo is saying, right? But then use the wisdom and insight you gain from your experiences with them to benefit and guide others. So the idea in a different kind of format to be able to phrase it is, um, you know, like it's really hard to guide people out of suffering if you've never experienced suffering yourself. So go out there, go experience suffering, you know, which Sugendo training is made to make you suffer. Like go and experience suffering so that you can learn something from it. And then you can learn, you can use that, that knowledge, you know, to be able to help others. So you can see there's still that similar kind of thought of like, you go into a liminal space to be able to gain some kind of power, some kind of insight, some kind of knowledge, so that then you can take back that experience with you, that power with you to be able to help others. So don't be afraid of the three poisons. If they're there, just be with them, sit with them, get to know them intimately, so that then you can use that knowledge and insight to guide others out of them. So this is in a nutshell the presentation that I had for Shugendo today. Keep in mind, it's a very large, very kind of old tradition and it doesn't encompass, uh, you know, most of what could have been said about it. I just wanted to stick to the core of it. Uh, for those who are interested, these are the sources that I've um, 
that I've used. Um, if you are in uh, like the last one, the Shugendo now is actually a documentary. It's one of the, the first time I've ever encountered Shugendo in my life. I was at university studying, you know, Japanese Buddhism, whatever. And the person showed part of the documentary. I was like, that's awesome. Uh, and I was able to kind of find it and rewatch it again. You have to pay to be able to have access to it. But if you're interested into just learning, it's basically people that are following the life of one particular Shugenja. So if you want to have an insight of how one particular Shugenja is kind of like going about his life as a Shugendo practitioner in the modern world, you can go and, and watch this. And there's very interesting um, things of like, in order to adapt to the modern world, they're making it a thing that like you can have like group activities, like, you know, like a, a particular department at work. You know, there's like 12 people working in a department that's kind of like, oh, we're just going to go all 12 of us and do like a part of the Shugendo training in the mountains to try to foster, you know, connection and like, and, uh, you know, spiritual insights, whatever. So there's very interesting ways that Shugendo, just like the rest of Buddhism, is adapting to the modern world. And this, uh, the, uh, this documentary is going to give you a little bit of insight of how one person is going about it. So that is it for my presentation, which leaves room for a question of comments, if we still have time, as Mochin Sensei alluded to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank one, you. One, one of, yes, thank you very much, Maxine. That was excellent. You did a great job in a short time. Mm -hmm. And why don't we ask Ichishima Sensei if he has any comments about that before I make any... You might want to expand it so that people can see. <laughs> and we'll... It's Shima Sensei, do you have any comments you would like oh, to make? Well, thank you very much, Maxim. Uh, interesting topics of Shugendo. Uh, when I was in California, I acquainted with uh, uh, Bimara Kiriti Keisho. Uh, she passed away, unfortunately, one of the Tendai monks in California. Uh, she, 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 she was a member of some Warwick's group of Shugendo in San Francisco area, especially at uh, uh, some mountains uh, called uh, Mount Tamaru Pais. Uh, you know, this is that Mount Tamaru Pais is uh, very close to Golden Gate Bridge. The height is almost the same as uh, uh, Shiaizan. And uh, they asked me how to do our uh, uh, kaifogyo there. Uh, so, uh, and that, at that time, Bimara uh, Kirti uh, Keisho uh, always uh, uh, copied what I have said. Uh, it is quite interesting that they, they all wear Shugendo, traditional Shugendo style. About uh, 20 people joined together. I'm not sure still they are continuing. But Shimendo is uh, one of the interesting point to practice at mountain uh, practice. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Shingon or Tendai, uh, in the case of Tendai, uh, Futara-san, uh, you know, uh, uh, what shall I say? I forgot. Northern area of Japan, uh, they are practicing uh, Shugendo. One of my disciples in uh, Venice, uh, France, uh, he has trained there over 10 years and then coming up to Mount Hie and uh, he wanted to practice Kai Hogyo, etc. But uh, he, he couldn't speak Japanese, so he came to my temple and uh, he practiced that kind of things and also Tendai practices. This is just uh, my in, what shall I say, experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, the, one of the things I Mike mentioned is that um, Maxine mentioned it uh, early in his presentation that when we're dealing with the history, of course, uh, what we think of as Shugendo predated uh, Japanese, predated Buddhist um, meeting Buddhism in, in Japan. And so it took many of the, what I'll refer to as proto Shinto. Uh, practices because it wasn't really the Shinto that we think of today. It was really folk religions. Each village had its own its own style, its own kami um, uh, deities, etc. And but after the after a period of time, after, during the Tokugawa, it had to be more regulated. And so I was very surprised once we became a Betsuin, a, a, a registered temple and a branch of of Enrakuji. 
we get the uh, directory, the registry, what is it, every quarter, Tamami? Do we get it? The registry is depends upon whenever they need to update. Whenever they and update it. Once in every two years. Yeah, so we get the registry, and there's a whole section in the back of all the Shugendo temples. And so in the back of this registry, it's formulized today sufficiently so that the Shugendo temples have a separate have a separate entry. There's temples that are in different regions by different districts. We're in a separate section because we're a Betsawin, um, so we would be in a separate district. There's other separations within the registry. But it's really interesting just to see that um, in many ways it's an anachronistic uh, set of practices, and yet it's still finding people who choose to follow that as their primary path. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether it's increasing, decreasing, or it's static, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting set of practices. And, and I think Maxine was uh, doing us a service because I think we can be lulled into thinking that the temples operate this way or that way, and we think of it in a more regular fashion. Maybe we, we imagine it using other models like the Catholic Church or uh, the different divisions of, of Judaism or something like that. But realistically, in Japan, there are very idiosyncratic um, practices which are still considered part of the normative process. They're idiosyncratic in the way they merge together the various uh, belief systems within Buddhism, Shinto, etc. But they're still uh, considered just as, as um, legitimate as Tendai or Pure Land or whatever the other school of Buddhism might be. So, thank you.